Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another podcast from PI's Reproductive Rights and Privacy Project. My name is Sarah Nelson, and I lead the Reproductive Rights Project here at PI. I wanted to speak with Ruth because um, as an organization that works directly with people seeking reproductive health services, um, I thought that she would have an interesting insight into how opposition groups are trying to curtail access to such services. Um, and so I hope you enjoy this conversation I had with Ruth. Maybe to begin, we could t- you could talk a bit about um, the misinformation that you're seeing um, promoted to clients. Yeah, for sure. So at ASM, we provide people with non-judgmental information, advice and support about how to access an abortion, um, specifically for people who live in countries where abortion is illegal or highly restricted. Um, and we see all sorts of misinformation being promoted to clients. Um, at the moment, we support people in Ireland, Northern Ireland, and the Isle of Man, which were the places we started supporting back in 2009, as well as Malta, Gibraltar, and Poland, which we added just in the past year. Um, and we know that, you know, over the past 10 years, probably hundreds of clients who've come to ASN have um, been misinformed about abortion and in different ways. And some of that will have been misinformation that came to them through um, friends and family, especially um, you know, in Ireland before the 8th was, re- was repealed, there were people whose friends and family would be putting them off abortions. Um, but also um, there's definitely been a big problem with crisis pregnancy centers. And I think um, what we see most of the time now is that people are trying to delay women um, and pregnant people who want an abortion from getting that abortion. Um, So they are trying to um, tell them that they are further along in their pregnancy than they are, or they're trying to tell them that they've miscarried or that they're not pregnant or that they can't get an abortion in order for them to actually not be able to get one because they've gone past the legal time limit. Um, And I think there's an idea, there's sometimes a conception that abortion misinformation just means um, people telling lies about the impacts of an abortion or people telling lies about how um, the abortion procedure goes or people showing misleading photos and videos. Um, And actually, I think what we're seeing more of the time now is misinformation that is about trying to delay someone from getting an abortion. Mm. And actually, um, you know, in some ways that can be more, um, could be more dangerous, can be more nefarious, because actually, you know, most of the women who contact us, they are really sure about the fact that they want an abortion. And actually, even if someone's been saying to them, oh, you're going to go to hell, or you're going to get depression, or you're going to be infertile, um, most of them know that that's not true. So in a sense, that misinformation um, is not as dangerous as someone saying to them, oh, you're too late, and that not being true, because they might believe, oh, you're too late, I'm too late to get an abortion, I can't get one. And whereas they may be less likely to believe that they're going to hell, or they may, that may not bother them because they've already decided on it. So yeah, mainly what we're seeing is um, kind of delay tactics. And maybe you could go through some examples of what the different forms of misinformation you're seeing in in the different countries where you guys work, Um, especially sort of both what people are being, when people look online for information, sort of what is, what's there that's sort of misinformed people. And then also, as you, as you said, the the different sort of crisis pregnancy centers that people that you, your clients have gone to and been misinformed about their pregnancies. Yeah, absolutely. So, Um, ASM was set up in 2009 primarily to support um, women in Ireland who were traveling to the UK to get an abortion, which has been a very common abortion travel route pretty much since, um, you know, abortion became legal in the UK. Um, And so we've got a lot of experience from Ireland relating to this issue. And there's always been, um, you know, for a really long time, there's been crisis pregnancy centers. So, um, we use the term crisis pregnancy centers to mean places that are presenting as though they are legitimate um, and as though they're going to be able to provide support 
and they might be providing some things, they might be providing ultrasounds, etc. Um, but they're not actually providing, you know, what's known as three options counselling um, in terms of going through with, with a woman and the options to have an abortion, to parent or to adopt, which was the, the three options that of counselling they used to provide in Ireland. Um, these crisis pregnancy centres would really be trying to put women off abortion and really um, encourage them to have a baby. And a lot of these present as quite reputable. Um, and I didn't look this up and I probably could have done, but I'm the numbers of crisis pregnancy centres in Ireland and Northern Ireland are really quite high. You know, there were probably before the repeal of the Eighth Amendment, there were probably more crisis pregnancy centres in Ireland than there were legitimate places where a woman could go to get three options counselling. So before the repeal of the eighth, a woman would go to the Irish Family Planning Association, the IFPA, or to a well woman clinic, and they would give her this, you know, three options counselling. Um, and also they could provide information about travelling abroad. But I think there were, I'm almost certain there were more rogue crisis pregnancy centres in Ireland than there were actual three options counselling centres mm -hmm. um, and yeah they looked very reputable um, and some of them um, actually were run by the church you know they were run by um, by the catholic church um, mm -hmm. or they were associated to the catholic church and mm -hmm. um, there was also previously there was a mary stopes clinic again before repeal and there was a mary stopes clinic in dublin and that would refer women on to the uk for treatment at mary stopes clinic in the uk um, and there was a um, crisis pregnancy centre set up next door um, that would um, try to um, you know basically get women who were on their way to Mary Stopes would get them into the crisis pregnancy centre instead um, which is just um, you know disgusting intimidation tactics um, really really awful um, and then even last year so you know the referendum to repeal the 8th happened in May 2018 and um, Ireland got their act together really quickly and got their abortion provision, provision ready from the beginning of January 2019. Um, and it's called My Options. Um, and there was a guy called Eamon Murphy, who's quite well known in this, um, in this area. And um, he set up a fake my options website which mimicked the actual my options website um, and he tried to make it look neutral and very much like the um, real one that had been set up by the um, Irish Health Service um, but actually it was about trying to dissuade women from getting an abortion um, and he was taken to court um, I believe and that website was taken down um, but that shows you how easy it is for people to do things like that and for other people to be, um, you know, hoodwinked by them. Um, then even last year in 2019, um, you know, the abortion law changed and um, you can now get an abortion on request up to 12 weeks in Ireland. And the service is largely GP led and it's largely delivered um, through early medical abortion, um, which is abortion with pills. Um, you know, and um, we're still being contacted by people who um, are over the 12 week limit. Um, and last year we were contacted by a number of clients who had been to crisis pregnancy centres, um, including one who went to a CPC, was told she was over 12 weeks and therefore couldn't get an abortion in Ireland. Um, she knew what she wanted to do, so she was determined to come to the UK and travel. Um, so it was too late for her to get an abortion in Ireland by the time she realised that she'd only been nine weeks at the beginning and she came to the UK, but they had half succeeded, you know, they told her she was 12 weeks and she'd waited a little bit longer and um, she was only nine weeks. So they did delay her, you know, she had to come to the UK um, and seek our support to pay for her abortion rather than getting one for free in Ireland. Um, and we also heard last year from two clients who'd been told by their doctors that they'd miscarried um, when they were under 12 weeks um, only to discover once they were beyond the 12, 12 week limit that they were still pregnant um, and both these women believed that their doctors had told them this on purpose um, and one of them who was an asylum seeker who'd been raped had actually been told this by two different doctors wow. um, 
I actually spoke, I don't do a huge amount of time um, on our helpline, but I actually spoke to this client um, and she was so distressed. You know, she'd been raped by someone who she thought was a friend. Um, she was an asylum seeker. She was a long way from home. And then she'd been told by two doctors, um, a local doctor and a doctor in A&E, that she'd had a miscarriage. Um, and luckily we were able to help her. But because she was an asylum seeker, it's really complicated. Um, you know, getting a visa for someone um, yeah. she lives in the Netherlands um, rather than coming to the UK um, is really complicated. Um, it's just so many hoops to jump through if you're in that situation. Um, and, you know, those two clients believed that um, their doctors were anti-choice um, and had told, had misinformed them on purpose because they didn't want to help them get an abortion. Um, so there is an issue with, you know, anti-choice doctors spreading misinformation, um, as well as the anti-choice groups who are presenting as crisis pregnancy centres. And we're also concerned that because the new abortion provision in Ireland is GP-led, which in some ways is fantastic, um, the, it has other um, downsides. So if someone presents at their doctor and they are 11 and a half or 12 weeks or 13 weeks pregnant, their doctor might say to them, okay, you're too late, um, and might not know that there is the option for them to come to the UK or go to the Netherlands. Um, whereas previously, when women were going to the um, IFPA or the Well Women Clinic, um, the counsellors there were always referring women to the UK because that was what happened. So I think we worry that there's a bit of misinformation around that um, and that there are people who are falling through the net uh, because their doctors aren't saying to them, actually, you're 12 weeks pregnant. If you do want an abortion, you can go to the UK. Instead, they're saying, okay, you're 12 weeks pregnant. You can't have an abortion. And that's problematic. Mm. Um, that is problematic. So that's, that's quite a few, few examples from Ireland, which is where we've been, yeah, for 10 years. So obviously that's, you know, um, we've got a lot of evidence from Ireland. Um, and then in February last year, we opened um, to people from Malta. Um, so Malta has a much smaller population than Ireland, but is also the only place in Europe where abortion is illegal in all circumstances, if I remember rightly. Um, so in June last year, we issued a press, press release with BPAS, the British Pregnancy Advisory Service, um, because we'd come across a number of um, women, a number of clients who had been targeted by anti-choice groups in attempts to stop them accessing care overseas. Um, there was one group who'd shared women's phone numbers and email addresses with an anti-abortion group in Ireland. Um, and we had another person um, who pretended to be an employee from an abortion clinic and told a young woman that she needed to delay her procedure by two months at which point it would have been too late for her to come um, to the UK or anywhere else. Um, and there was another anti-abortion activist um, who pretended she'd help a woman get an abortion and then sent her abusive text messages and visited her phone, visited her home, sorry, trying to dissuade her from having an abortion, okay. um, which is enormously problematic. Um, you know, we know um, that uh, there was a group you know, the most extreme end. And um, there was a young woman um, who had been helped in Malta by what she thought was a, um, you know, a supportive crisis pregnancy centre, which turned out to be an anti-choice group who used fake email addresses to send her um, misinformation about abortion um, and who used, um, who then passed her phone number and email address to someone back in, someone in Ireland, who then pretended to be from BPAS um, and then told her that she couldn't have an appointment for two months. Um, and we were speaking to this young woman and um, we knew something was fishy from what she was saying because they told her that the ultrasound she'd had in Malta wasn't good enough. Um, they told her she needed to have a 4D ultrasound. Um, mm -hmm. Um, that's not true. None of the clinics in the UK would require anyone to have a 4D ultrasound. So she told us that and we said, that doesn't sound right. Who have you been talking to? 
and worked out that the people she'd been talking to were not BPAS and were pretending to be BPAS, um, which again should be illegal. I'm sure it is mm. um, in some way. And they'd also been sharing her telephone number and email address amongst themselves, amongst various different people in the group in Malta, and then with um, this person back in Ireland who called her up and pretended to be from BPAS. That's wild. Um, can, I, can I just ask also how? In all of those cases in Malta that you mentioned, how was the initial sort of information collected from people? So um, from what we understand, there is, um, there is either a group of people or um, a centre in Malta, which looks like it's a legitimate crisis pregnancy centre. Um, and clients go there seeking support to get an abortion. Um, and then actually the people running it are anti-choice, which means that they um, will say they will help the woman, they will help the client get um, an ultrasound. They've got doctors who they'll help her go and get an ultrasound with. Um, and they'll start acting as though they're supporting her. Um, but in reality, they won't. And we also know that there is a website which may or may not be linked to that same group. In Malta so sometimes people will get in touch via the website um, I think it's varied a little bit and I think there's also some anti-choice doctors in Malta who if a woman goes to them they will refer her on to other members of the like anti-choice groups um, and then they'll share the information um, share the clients uh, contact information around each other to sort of do really like you know a multi-channel assault on someone um, so calling them, texting them, asking them to come to more appointments, visiting, um, their, home. <laughs> visiting their home, exactly, you know, and often, often clients are really vulnerable um, and there's very little, um, there's very little support in Malta and also in Gibraltar for women who are in this sort of situation. Um, there's no rape crisis centres, um, there's no family planning, um, so I think what happens as well is when someone, you know, when a abortion seeker comes across someone who seems like they want to help them, um, that's immediately really attractive, you know, and actually having met someone, you know, if you're a young, a young woman living in Malta and you meet someone in Malta who says, yes, I can help you. Um, and they start acting as though they're helping you. They help you access an ultrasound. They're, they're saying, how are you feeling? What can we do? Um, you know, I can see how that could be quite persuasive to someone and how that could feel easier than, you know, people Googling our website and finding out about us and then having to call someone in the UK for help. I can see how a real life person in front of you can be more appealing. Yeah. Um, but they're not actually they're not actually going to help anyone get an abortion. They're trying to delay them for as long as possible. So all of the people who have found us have found us. But then, you know, one of the good things since we launched in Malta, um, you know, there has been a change actually in how the press is talking about abortion, I think, since we launched. We launched on Valentine's Day last year um, and then uh, we did a press release around the one year on and just some of the language in some of the Maltese media has, has started to shift and they've now got some pro-choice groups for the first time. Um, but the in general the sentiment the anti-abortion sentiment in malta is so strong um, that we get loads of free press coverage um, because people love talking about us um, and they literally will mention our phone number in articles that are about how awful we are so all of that is good for us <laughs> you know, it's good for us it's helping us um, but I can see how, you know, if, if there are anti-choice groups who've got a presence in Malta and who are able to find, find women when they're, at, you know, potentially at their most vulnerable and influence them, they're right there, whereas we're still just, you know, strangers on the internet. Yeah, yeah, totally. And actually also, the, you know, we know um, Gibraltar, so we launched, we opened for Gibraltar at the same time as Malta, so in February last year. Gibraltar is a very small place. It's got a population of about 35,000. Um, but we know that there's misinformation there as well. Again, they've got quite a strong kind of anti-choice lobby, which is mainly um, old white men, of course. Um, but I was over there about a year ago and met some teenagers who were telling me that um, 
lots of anti-abortion leaflets and stickers get passed around at school mm -hmm. um, there's definitely misinformation happening there as well um, so we see it you know it, it is everywhere it is everywhere yeah um that's i mean there's so many different examples of it it's just crazy to to see sort of how much people have to get through to access yeah. the the health care that they are deserving of you know yeah and i think that's the issue is that um you know the it does lots of different things this sort of misinformation the main thing it does is obviously it delays someone it delays people from getting care it also can make someone feel worse about the decision that they're making um you know i think i don't want to make up statistics but i think um there's the new the new study that came out quite recently that found that something like 95 percent of women do not regret their abortion um but i think um using these sorts of tactics to misinform women and make them feel bad about that choice that's having a neg potentially having a negative impact on their mental health um, and also making them question their own decisions and their own agency and whether they should trust themselves yeah. um, and i think you know the other big thing the delay does is it forces people to travel when they're beyond 12 weeks which makes their abortion more expensive um it's a key thing um and um you know it's um most of the time it's not stopping women from getting an abortion it's just making it harder for them and there are so many hoops that women have to jump through anyway um in lots of places um that actually it's just adding a whole a whole extra one you know you've got um if you're traveling rather than you know say in ireland where now you can get an abortion up to 12 weeks um if you are if you're getting your abortion and you're nine or ten weeks pregnant you're going to have an abortion with pills you're going to largely self-manage and you're going to be able to do that at home you might take a day or so off work depending on how your abortion goes for you um if you um are forced to you know if you're delayed by someone telling you that um, you can't have an abortion or whatever they've told you until you're 13 or 14 weeks or later you're going to have to travel to the UK which means you're going to have to arrange your um, tram your transport you might have to arrange childcare you might have to arrange more time off work um, and you're going to have to pay for your abortion in the UK rather than getting it for free at home um, and we know that when you make abortion um, you know illegal or hard to access you make it illegal and hard to access for poor people and for poor women um and those are the people who we help um but really it shouldn't matter if you're rich or poor you should be able to get that abortion for free at home in an ideal world so it's just adding this extra layer of complexity and hoops to jump through um that really just aren't necessary no um, harmful and um you know meaning that i think people can feel worse about a decision that actually they were fairly confident about when they started looking for their looking for their care and we know as well that there's also um you know lots of websites online that spread a lot of misinformation about abortion um but i mean you'll know more about this than i do i don't know what any of us can do about misinformation on the internet about anything um, it, <laughs> all we can do is try and provide accurate information somewhere else because I think this is, you know, one of the great problems of the era that we're living in is um, how people can distinguish between what's real and what's, um, you know, what's truthful and accurate and something that isn't and is just presenting as though it is. Mm -hmm. um, and we also know that there's, um, you know, websites that sell, claim to sell, um, pills so um early medical abortion pills we always refer our clients to women help women mm -hmm. and women on web um, because they're reputable we've got a good relationship with both of them um, but we know that there's lots of websites that are selling those pills um, or claiming to sell those pills and they might be selling something else that might be actively dangerous or they might be selling pills that are out of date or that are just ineffective and again if someone you know orders pills and they turn out to be ineffective then all that's happened then is that they've delayed their abortion mm -hmm. okay, so if someone is if someone's created a website that's claiming to sell the pills and that is selling 
a fake version of the pills that doesn't do anything, a woman orders them and takes them and nothing happens, she's still going to want to get her abortion. And in fact, she's probably more likely to want to get her abortion after that because even if the pills didn't have any active ingredients in them, she's going to think that she's already had some sort of, you know, she's already affected the pregnancy by trying to induce an abortion. So again, you're just delaying women. Yeah. And we know that in Poland, where we've only been active um, since last year as well, um, that that's a real issue, that there's a real issue with um, websites claiming to sell pills um, or selling pills that aren't effective. Just Polish websites that are set up to sell. The yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's our, our Polish, um, so our, pro, our Polish initiative is called Abortion Without Borders and that's delivered with, um, we've got two partners in Poland and then we partner with Women Help Women and with a group in Germany and a group in the Netherlands and the Polish groups have told us that there's a real issue in Poland with um, fake websites for, you know, fake pills or fake websites yeah. claiming to sell pills, yeah, yeah. that's a real problem. Um, do you have, did you have a sense from the organizations if the point of those websites is to just sort of delay, as you said, or to understand who is seeking an abortion as well, like to understand who those people are and where they're based and all of that? That's a really interesting question. I'm not sure. When I um, spoke to our Polish partner about it, she said that it was, oh, you know, they're selling fake pills. And I think, I think they believe that there's also a financial incentive there, okay. which is, you know, you get women to pay money and then you don't send them anything yeah. you know it's a, it's a scam um but it could also be that the data collection going on there uh, you know that's something that we and our polish partners are really careful about um in terms of how our data collection and data storage of people who come to us seeking help um because um they are you know people it's the situation in poland is um tougher than it is um, in the other places where we're operating. So we're being very careful about what data we're collecting um, from people who need our help yeah. uh, and being really stringent on that. But as you say, there could be groups in Poland who are trying to collect information about women who are seeking abortions in order to you know, use that as a way of intimidating them um, or blackmailing or something like that. Mm -hmm. Try and find out more on that. It could be really interesting to look at. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time for going through. You're very welcome. Thank you.